I Renovation community and anyone else who's watching. At 83 years old in 1893, William Gladstone became Prime Minister of Great Britain for the fourth time. Michelangelo was nearly 67 in 1641 when he completed the Last Judgment painting at the altar in the Sistine Chapel. At 66, Noah Webster completed his first American dictionary. Peter Roger invented the thesaurus in 73 years old. Grandma Moses, one of the most famous American painters who completed over 1,500 paintings, had rarely picked up a brush until age 76. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, continued preaching and traveling until he was 87, when his health suddenly declined and he died less than a year later. At what age will you give up your radical commitment to God and start looking like everyone else? At what age will you decide you have nothing more to offer this world on behalf of God? A teenage Jewish boy named Daniel was taken captivity by King Nebuchadnezzar, who captured Jerusalem and took Daniel and other young promising men to be trained in his court as palace advisors. It's even possible the teenage boy's capture happened a decade or two before Jerusalem's fall in 586 BC. As a teenager in the first chapter of the book that bears his name, Daniel stood his ground by keeping kosher food practices while living in a foreign country. He's absent in the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, but then he appears again when he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's God-sent nightly dreams. Between the dream interpretation in chapter 4 and the famous writing on the wall interpretation at King Belshazzar's party in chapter 5, at least four different kings or rulers have come to power and quickly died or been executed. And Nebuchadnezzar's empire has fallen to the rising Medo-Persian empire. Chapter 6 says the ruler is now a man called Darius the Mede, or some say Darius the Mede. Just pick your pronunciation and move on with confidence. Now I'm going to pause for something I rarely discuss in Sunday sermons, how to interpret the Bible and the Bible's trustworthiness. I don't generally think a message for the main Sunday service is the time to talk about this stuff, but I'm breaking my rule today because there's so much skepticism in academic circles about the book of Daniel. It's honestly one of the most controversial books in the Old Testament. Non-Christian historians and plenty of Christian ones just don't believe it. At least they don't believe it's an accurate portrayal of ancient history. So in case you Google Daniel to learn more, I want to give you some perspectives on how you can sift through that skepticism. There's plenty of evidence showing ancient peoples wrote and shared extended stories of fiction for the purpose of teaching important lessons. Jesus shared short stories like these in the New Testament called parables. We don't read the story of the prodigal son and think, I wonder what historical figure he was referring to, because we've been taught that a parable is just an imaginary story to prove a point. But imagine if Jesus had spent several chapters telling that story, adding historical and geographical places, names of people, and time periods. He'd be telling the same story to illustrate the same point but it would suddenly seem much more real and historical. You'll find some scholars who say that's what the story of Daniel is. There are non-biblical ancient stories that fit this description, and we have an entire genre of literature that does something similar today. We call it historical fiction. There's even plenty of excellent Christian historical fiction books following the life of Christian characters during the time period of the New Testament. If you're reading a historical fiction novel, the book's cover lets you know it's got true historical details in it, but a lot of other stuff that's been added to it. If you know enough about the historical setting of the novel, you don't usually need help figuring out which parts are fiction and which parts are history. But if you're not an expert, for example, on the history of Persia in the 6th century BC, the setting of Daniel, it would be hard to know which parts of a story are true and which parts are fiction parts that have been added to move the story along. 
Some history and Bible scholars say the book of Daniel is a piece of historical fiction. They say modern people interpret it as literal, literal history when it's supposed to be read like historical fiction, like an extended parable intended to teach certain truths about God. Other scholars, scholars come right out and say the book of Daniel was meant to be read as history, but the writer made up the entire story and got the dates wrong. On that second perspective, I would wholeheartedly disagree. But one so-called proof they use comes here in Daniel chapter 6. Historians tell us the next Persian king after Belshazzar in Daniel chapter 5 should have been Cyrus I, also known as Cyrus the Great, who's mentioned other places in the Bible, not Darius the Mede. There's two other kings named Darius mentioned in the Old Testament books, but they come several decades later in history. No other existing historical or archaeological artifacts refer to a king of this time with the name Darius the Mede. Some scholars say this proves this story in Daniel chapter 6, or maybe most of the stories in Daniel, are fiction. As you might guess, I don't believe that. They use this name problem as evidence to say the writer of Daniel invented the whole story, confused his chronology, and mixed up his kings, putting King Darius before King Cyrus. But the truth might be a lot simpler. Maybe this man's reign was so short-lived, there's not enough archaeological evidence accumulated about him. Or, since Darius was used as the name for several Persian kings, some scholars wonder if Darius was more like a title, like Pharaoh or Caesar. If that's the case, the book of Daniel could actually be describing King Cyrus. Or, maybe Darius the Mede was some unknown governor appointed by Cyrus to rule Babylon. This was how several of the men, all with the name Herod, ruled Israel in New Testament times. They had the title of king, but they really acted more like appointed governors acting on behalf of Caesar in Rome. Last, just because archaeologists haven't found proof of a historical Darius the Mede yet, doesn't mean they never will. For a couple hundred years, some scholars believed King David in the Bible was entirely fictional because no archaeological evidence existed for him. None. Not a single archaeological artifact anywhere in the Near East ever even mentioned a King David of Israel. If the Bible was the only place that ever mentioned him, they said, the Bible probably made him up. But in 1993, archaeologists found what's called the Tel Dan Stele. Tel is a term referring to a mound at ancient city locations where centuries of human artifacts accumulated in layer over layer. And Dan was a particular area, and a stele is an archaeological term usually referring to a monument often commissioned by ancient kings to record their achievements. The Tel Dan stele recorded the achievements of a king from Damascus, an enemy of Israel in the 9th century BC. It records how one of the king's men killed Jehoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, and the king of the house of David. This one artifact corroborated the names of three kings mentioned in the Bible. Archaeological evidence for King David had existed all along. It just was waiting for someone to dig it up. Obviously, I'm biased, but I believe the Bible is more trustworthy than a lot of people give it credit for. Just because we don't understand something in Scripture doesn't automatically mean it's not true. If my inability to understand a concept automatically proves it's false, then algebra is entirely false, and I shouldn't have had to retake it in summer school. But I digress. Back to Daniel chapter 6, where it says Darius appointed 120 men as governors or satraps over the empire, with three men presiding over those 120, and Daniel was one of those three men. Verse 3 reminds us of Joseph's trajectory in the Egyptian government. 
Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. But this makes some of Daniel's government peers jealous. Verse 4, at this the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt or negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis of charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. As we've been walking through the 52 major Bible stories in 52 weeks, there's been a recurring theme I've talked about in these Old Testament stories. How the religious laws, feasts, and heroes all serve as a foreshadowing of Jesus. Using that same metaphor, like seeing someone's shadow around a corner before you see them. The good qualities we see in Old Testament heroes like Daniel should ultimately point us to Jesus. Reminding us, Daniel lived a good life, but Jesus lived a perfect life. But I don't want to minimize the importance of modeling our own lives after the best qualities we see in Old Testament heroes like Daniel. As Christians, we should strive to live in such a way that our enemies can't dig up any dirt on us. That they find us trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And the only way they could charge us with something would have to do with the law of our God, Jesus. So Daniel's jealous peers in government make a plan they hope will get him killed. They've long seen his practice of praying three times a day facing towards Jerusalem with his windows open and everyone able to see him. This practice probably wasn't unique to Daniel in Psalm 55, 17. David says, evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. In fact, Daniel probably knew about this psalm and was trying to obey it. He clearly knew his scriptures. And the idea of having some sort of prayer room on top of your house with a roof over it to protect you from the sun and windows to let the breeze through probably wasn't unusual. Peter probably had similar accommodations when he went on a roof to pray in Acts 10 verse 9. It seems Daniel's government peers all know he has faithfully kept this practice for years. And because of his devotion to his God, they're counting on him to continue, no matter the consequences. These jealous peers appeal to the king's vanity and suggest he enact a law where all the people pray only to him for the next 30 days. This flattered the king and he agrees to put it in writing. And according to their customs, once a king put a law in writing, it couldn't be changed for any reason. But Daniel doesn't flinch. Verse 10 says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Notice that last phrase, just as he had done before. Daniel isn't making a new reactionary statement here. There's times for that when God's people take some new action, expressing their devotion as a response or some sort of protest to new government action. But that's not what Daniel did here. He simply continued praying the way he always had. In fact, because of the sneaky, jealous officials, the law was created precisely because of how he prayed. Verse 11, Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. Clearly the king admired Daniel and trusted him enough to appoint him to high government office. But he doesn't seem to know about Daniel's daily prayer practices, and so he doesn't expect the official's next words. Then they said to the king, 
Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed and was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. Of course, it was more miraculous than that because the hungry lions could have still clawed him to death. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and people of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of the kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Again, if the Bible is using Darius as some sort of title, like Pharaoh or Caesar, the original Aramaic of that last verse also allows it to be translated, so Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius, even the reign of Cyrus the Persian. As I've already said, I've taught extensively on how the Old Testament figures like Daniel serve as types of Christ's. In other words, they serve as shadows of Jesus who would come centuries later. And there's no shortage of excellent messages discussing the miracles of remaining unharmed after spending the night with starved lions. But today, I want to focus on the consistent characteristics Daniel had that would lead his enemies to create this plan and know, because of Daniel's clockwork behavior, that their plan would work. Psychologist Angela Duckworth wrote a New York Times best-selling book entitled Grit, which describes her research into people's long-term success and why it happens. Across all education and socioeconomic levels, she determines one of the most critical factors for success was what she called grit. Here's some of the ways she defines it. Passion and perseverance for very long-term goals having stamina, sticking with your future day in, day out, not just for the week, not just for the month, but for years, and working really hard to make that future a reality. Grit is living life like it's a marathon, not a sprint. I'd say Daniel had grit, but to use Angela Duckworth's language, what long-term goal did Daniel have the passion and perseverance to keep in the forefront of his mind? Well, we get some idea way back in chapter 1, verse 8, when he was still a teenager and had resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. His resolve wasn't about eating unhealthy food or unhygienic food. They didn't even think in those terms back then. 
his resolve was about eating religiously unclean or impure food. His resolve is a desire to stay faithful, pure, in every way about his relationship with God. Remember the beginning of this message when I shared the accomplishments of seniors? And then I asked two questions. At what age will you give up your radical commitment to God and start looking like everyone else? At what age will you decide you have nothing more to offer this world? Between chapter 1 and chapter 6, when Daniel is thrown in the lion's den, as much as 65 years have passed. We know that from tracking the reigns of kings mentioned throughout the book. By verse 1 of chapter 6, when Daniel was appointed as one of the three chief officials in the empire, he was 80 or possibly close to 90 years old. That would have been exceptionally unusual in ancient times. But remember, this whole nasty situation started when Daniel's peers in office became jealous about the new government position the king planned to give him. He was still an active civil servant to kings in his 80s. This whole situation could have been avoided if he just retired, or if he felt he should stay in government office to be a godly influence. Surely he could have just prayed for the next 30 days with his upstairs windows closed, or prayed silently in his mind as we went about his day. He's faithfully served God in a difficult pagan environment for almost his entire life. Surely he could relax a bit now. Surely God wouldn't want him to be a legalist. But Daniel's got spiritual and religious grit. If your goal is success in all the ways the world defines it, especially financial success, you only need that gritty, persevering attitude long enough to earn that initial success. Then you can often just coast on your celebrity status or your stock market dividends. And as long as you don't lose too much status or money, you'll die with the world viewing you as successful. But that's not how godly biblical success works. Shortly before the Apostle Paul's death, while awaiting trial and subsequent execution in Rome, he wrote the letter we call 2 Timothy. In it, he said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Daniel understood he couldn't coast on past spiritual success. If he was going to finish strong in his faithful race towards God, he'd have to keep pushing on, no matter how hard it was. I remember watching some clickbait video that was compiling all the last seconds of all sorts of races, sports games, and boxing matches. In every clip, you watch someone celebrating their victory before they'd actually won. A sprinter slows down right before the finish line and begins pumping his arms in the air only to suddenly have another runner pass him. A bicyclist takes his hands off the handlebars, pumping his arms in the air, but he almost loses control of the bike and then watches another cyclist speed through the finish line. With just seconds on the clock, a soccer goalie blocks a shot and then runs in celebration. But the ball, which still has a little momentum, slowly rolls into the goal box and the referee awards a point to the other team. A boxer dances around the ring, confident he's going to win, only to be knocked unconscious seconds later. When I watched the video, I immediately thought of scripture. Somewhere in modern Christianity, we got the idea that you automatically grow closer to God as you age. That if you're an old Christian, you're automatically going to win the race set before you. Age can often bring added wisdom, but you can grow wise in humanity's eyes and not grow any closer to God 
And as your hormones level out and then wane, you may not be tempted to the same so-called big sins that you once committed, but that doesn't mean you won't struggle even more with less visible sins like worry, gluttony, sloth, apathy, greed, contempt, and a judgmental attitude. What's possibly the most frightening thing about this idea that with age automatically comes godliness is that the Bible seems to teach exactly the opposite. For almost every person in the Old Testament, spiritual apathy in old age was about as guaranteed as weight gain. One reason Daniel is so unique in Scripture is that he's one of the only people who doesn't commit some notable sin in their latter years. Doctors tell us proper diet and exercise become more important the older we get. Clearly, Daniel understands that principle applies to his spiritual life. Remember from our story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in chapter 1, it says theirs in Daniel's diet was nothing but vegetables and water because they were radically committed to keeping religious dietary laws. Now, I don't know for certain, but the books never tell us that Daniel and his friends ever relaxed their eating practices. And talk about spiritual exercise. Who on earth keeps a dedicated prayer service three times a day, no matter what? Especially if you have to leave work and go back home for your midday prayer time. That's intense spiritual discipline, not to mention the new risk of being executed for it. It's no wonder we don't read about Daniel's moral failures late in life. He's radically committed to his spiritual fitness and radically committed to being a spiritual force in his community until the day he dies. I'm not saying Christians shouldn't retire from whatever paying job they work. Sometimes it's actually good to retire so you can serve the world in other ways. But we never retire from our faith. We never retire from actively serving God in our world. If you're not nearing retirement age or whatever age you are now, you have the chance to chart a new commitment to your journey with Jesus. Or if you've never followed Jesus, Jesus before this time, you can begin today. Ask him to forgive you of your sins. Thank him for the forgiveness he gives you and begin following him today. If you do, I'd love to hear from you. But I'm not done. Angela Duckworth, the psychologist who wrote about grit, made a famous TED Talk that's been viewed over 20 million times. TED Talks are these short little lectures from people who come from all walks of life and are experts on various job fields. Near the end of her TED Talk on how important grit is for success, she kind of disappoints the listeners by saying she hasn't yet found a way to adequately teach grit. So you're left thinking, well, some people have what it takes to persevere in life and some don't. Bummer. When it comes to the type of spiritual grit Daniel had, the Bible's clear. No person can teach that either but we can discipline ourselves in order that God would teach us what no human ever could. Daniel's fasting from certain foods and setting aside time each day to pray are a few practices the church and Judaism before that has called spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines, habits we keep to reflect a posture of humility, inviting God's spirit to teach us shape us, and fill us when God gives us the spiritual grit no human could ever teach. Scripture sometimes describes God's Holy Spirit like water, living water to borrow Jesus' language. I once heard a pastor comparing spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines to placing yourself beneath God's faucet. You and I can't turn on God's Spirit in our lives or in this world. 
We can't just decide to obey God because we grit our teeth and do it. And we can't just expect revival to happen because our church holds something we call a revival service. Though we can pray for revival, every night for the last three years, our seven-year-old and I have been asking God to bring revival to our church. And we can commit to regularly practice actions that put us under God's faucet. Since Renovation Community officially launched in October 2018, we've always had these bookmarks on our worship tables each Sunday. We lay out eight practices to help us never stop growing more like Jesus. Bible engagement, not just reading the Bible like a robot, but actively engaging with it. Obeying God and denying self. Serving God and others. Sharing Christ with others. Exercising faith. Seeking God. In other words, going through life constantly seeking where God is and then joining Him there. Building relationships and practicing unashamed transparency. I don't believe you can separate Daniel's radical commitment to God from his radical commitment to spiritual practices to keep him away from sin and close to the very heart of God. And we should follow Daniel's example. We have this CD in Kelly's car we listen to on repeat with the boys. It's a children's choir singing old hymns and some old-fashioned children's Sunday school songs. One song we quickly learned the words to was Dare to be a Daniel. Standing by a purpose true, heeding God's command, honor them, the faithful few. All hail to Daniel's band. Many mighty men are lost, daring not to stand. Who for God had been a host by joining Daniel's band. Many giants, great and tall, stalking through the land, heading to the earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. Dare to make it known. Love you. Hope to see you in person next Sunday, June 14th. Talk to you soon.